I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm just fine, thank you. And you know what else I am? Yes, I'm sure you're anxious to start reading Peter Pan today. Yes, I am. I was so thrilled last week when I met Bobby Driscoll, who was in Walt Disney's movie of Peter Pan. Yes, I thought you'd like that. Oh, I did, I did. Well, then, my surprise made you happy, didn't it? I should say so. Nothing could be more wonderful than to learn that we're going to read Peter Pan in the comics. And for 25 weeks, too. Ooh, I won't miss one of them. So could we hurry now, uh, please, and read the funny stuff? Puck the comic weekly? Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the first section under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. <whistles> toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. <laughs> Beetle and his pals are at the home of a very nice lady who has invited them for a Sunday afternoon feed. Beetle's pal, Killer Diller, says, Say, it was mighty nice of you to invite our company over this afternoon, Mrs. Van Dividend. Mrs. Van Dividend replies, Oh, but I didn't expect so many. I always thought two was a company. Then Beetle and some other soldiers sidle over, and Beetle croaks, Can we help? Oh, yes, yes. I need more cookies from the bakery, and someone could take out this bag of garbage. Killer answers, Well, Beetle's good with the garbage. I'll go get the cookies. A minute later, Beetle, with the sack of garbage in his hand, walks into the kitchen. A beautiful French maid looks up and says, Oh, you are just in time. Hey, what a classy joint. And then looking at the pretty maid, Even the KP is good looking. Oh, uh, empty that bag in the silver tray and put it on the table in the library. Beetle looks at the silver tray, then it is garbage. He thinks she's crazy, but last picture, top row empties the garbage on the silver tray. This is the fanciest garbage pail I've ever seen. Now, boys, would anybody care to play Pachisi? First picture, bottom row, Beetle has carried the silver tray with the garbage on it into the living room and set it on a table. One of the boys looks at the junk on the tray and exclaims, Hey, this looks like garbage. Another G.I. says contemptuously, Quiet, you peasant. Ain't you never seen hors d'oeuvres before? Eat it. And a moment later, Mrs. Van Dividend sees the G.I.'s walking through the living room eating the garbage. She says to herself, Oh, my, what appetites. I should have gotten more food. <laughs> Two minutes later, the door opens. And Killer, who has been to the bakery, comes into the kitchen. Beetle says, Oh, Killer is back with the cookies. The maid, startled, exclaims, The cookies? But what did you put on the tray? The garbage. <laughs> oh, the garbage? Oh, my chop. <laughs> and last picture, the maid's in the living room. She sees Mrs. Van Dividen munching on the garbage and exclaims, Oh, it. remember your social graces. Make the boys feel at home. Have an apple core. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's one of the craziest things I've ever seen. Yes, imagine those stupid GIs <laughs> thinking that the garbage was ordered. But why didn't Mrs. Van Dividend tell them? Well, she felt that the boys liked the apple cores and the peelings from the fruit, so she thought she should eat them, too, to make the boys feel at home. Why, she certainly is. Yes, she certainly is. Is it time now for Peter Pan? Well, since you're so eager, we'll go to Peter Pan right away. So let's turn over the page and go past Prince Val, who's still trying to find a way to bring peace to his kingdom. Turn over another page. Oh, look, and there's Peter Pan on page five. Yes, Peter Pan. And we'll read that right away. So here we go with Peter Pan. 
Pirates, crocodiles, Peter Pan, whisk up music for Never Never Land. All this has happened before, and it will all happen again. This time it happened in London, in the home of the Darling family, where there were people who believed in Peter Pan. Upstairs in the nursery in the Darling house, the boys, Michael and John, are having a terrific time. They've rigged up the bed to look like a pirate ship with a sheet, broomstick, sail, and pirate flag. And they're having a fierce duel with wooden swords. One is pretending to be Captain Hook. The other pretending to be Peter Pan. Blast you, Peter Pan. I'll slit your gizzard. And then the door opens. And in comes Mother Darling, who stops astonished when she sees what's going on. Michael! John! Wendy, bedtime. And in the door comes their dog, Nana, a huge shaggy thing carrying a tray with a bottle and glasses on her head. Here's Nana with your tonic. Last picture, top row. Mrs. Darling straightens up the room. Father and I are going to a party tonight, and you must be sound asleep before we leave. And first picture, bottom row, she goes to the window to close it. Her daughter, Wendy, says, Oh, don't lock it, Mother. He might come back. He? Who might come back, dear? And Wendy answers as she falls asleep, Peter Pan. You see, I have something that Nana took away from him. His, his shadow. Soon, all is quiet in the nursery. And Mr. and Mrs. Darling depart for their party. As they come down the steps of the house, Mrs. Darling says to her husband, George, Wendy spoke about a shadow. Peter Pan's shadow. Huh? Oh, goodness gracious, sound the alarm. Call Scotland Yard. And last picture, as they go down the street, Mr. Darling says impatiently, Oh, really, Mary, of all the childish fiddle-faddle, Peter Pan indeed, poppycock. But at that moment, on top of a nearby house, a figure of a small boy wearing a peaked cap with a feather in it looks at them below, and hearing Mr. Darling, the boy laughs. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, I, I bet I know who that is on the rooftop. That's Peter. You bet. That's Peter Pan. And I'll bet you I know what he's doing. He's waiting for them to leave so he can go into Wendy's room and look for his shadow. And I'll bet you're right, and I'll bet next week we'll find out for sure. Oh, I can't wait. Neither can I. But now let's turn over the page. Oh, and here on page six is Flash Gordon. Yes, Flash Gordon, who is on the planet Venus, a prisoner of King Stang. And King Stang and put Flash and Zack off to work in the furnace room. Yes, and the foreman, a huge man, had swung his whip to hit Flash and tipped over a vat of acid, which poured across the room. But Flash quickly ran at that cruel man and pushed him out of the path of the acid and saved his life. I wonder if Flash is safe. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. rigga digga doon doon sash Let's set music for heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash's quick thinking and daring action saves the life of the huge Venusian guard. Quickly rallying his men after his narrow escape, Quillier manages to bring the fire under control with chemi spray apparatus. When all is calm again in the plant, the Venusian thinks back over the events of the last few minutes and wonders, why did that Earthman risk his life to save me? I had believed all Earthmen were as cruel as those who have enslaved us on Venus. Last picture, top row, Quillier says to Flash, I owe you my life. I hope to repay you someday. Zarkov, Flash's friend, breaks in. Why, you can repay him now. Zarkov gestures meaningly to a vial of chemicals in his hand. Just let Flash see Dale and give her this potion. <laughs> True to his word, Crillier arranges a meeting between Flash and Dale. First picture, bottom row, he arranges for Dale and Flash to meet in a storeroom outside the kitchen, where Dale has been preparing Stang's meals. Dale rushes into Flash's arms with a cry of joy. Flash lifts the vial of chemical into Dale's hand as they embrace and whispers, Sarkov has made this sleeping potion from stolen chemicals. It is tasteless, but you can... Suddenly, a curtain is flung open. And last picture, standing in the doorway, is Queen Vicky. Quickly, Dale hides the vial as the queen rages. So this is how our slaves spend their time. Quillier will pay for his laxity. Guards, seize these treacherous earthlings. Oh, dear. Why did the queen have to be listening behind that curtain? The 
shoes and that awful, just when Flash had found a friend to help him, this had to happen. Yes, now who will help Flash? What chance does he have? Well, now let's not become too unhappy. Maybe something new will develop. We'll find that out next week. But now, let's go across the page, past the Lone Ranger, turn over that page, and here, on the last page of the first section, is Dick's Adventures. I just have a hunch today that, that Dick is going to begin a new adventure. Well, let's read now and find out if your hunch is right. Here we go with Dick's Adventures in Dreamland. Say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a zick That's some music for adventurous Dick. Today, Dick is reading his American history again. He is reading of the days when America was still a young country and of one of America's famous generals, General Jackson. Dick says to his dad, Boy, oh boy, Dad, what a place New Orleans was during the War of 1812. Old Hickory, General Jackson was there, and so were pirates. Oh, boy. Oh, gosh, I'm sleepy. That last picture, top row. By the magic of his dream, Dick is whisked back to the gayest and most colorful city in the New World, New Orleans, the Paris of America, near the mouth of the Mississippi, a city thronging with fun-loving French, Spaniards, Creoles, Americans, and pirates. The year is 1814. America and England are still at war, and everywhere you go, there is talk of the war between America and Great Britain. First picture, second row, Dick is at an outdoor cafe having dinner with Major Gabriel Villers, a man famous in the city of New Orleans. Gabriel says, Ah, so the British have burned Washington, huh? Name you. We expect them to attack us soon. But meanwhile, we laugh. <coughs> Second, last picture, second row, there's a great commotion. A young man, splendidly dressed, sweeps down the street, escorted by a bodyguard of well-armed ruffians. <coughs> Here is the most charming, daring, handsome, and unscrupulous man in all Louisiana, the notorious pirate and smuggler, Jean Lafitte. Dick stares in amazement at the pirate chief, first picture bottom row. Then here's Major Villers say, Eh, home, Dick, we had better leave. Why? Dick's answer comes an instant later. The pirates want all the tables nearby. Away, boy! And Dick finds himself seized by two pirates, pulled up out of his chair, and tossed out on the street. Ah, we're here! <laughs> and the pirates take over. Oh, those pirates are so rough. Yes, they are. And Dick was so amazed seeing them, he didn't move fast enough. But why does the Major in uniform let those pirates treat him that way? Well, I'm afraid the Major has had experience with those pirates before and knows that they're rough. Well, things must be pretty bad down there if pirates rule the town. Yes, they are. And next week, we'll see what else Dick learns about these pirates. Now look at the bottom of the page. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes, Rusty Riley was run away. I'm anxious to find out what happens to him. Well, we'll find out in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the last page of the first section, Rusty Riley. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Rusty has run away because he has heard that his uncle, a mean man, was coming to get him. Rusty knew that his uncle would force him to help in some of his evil schemes. So Rusty has run away with the carnival. His friend Stovepipe, who is with the carnival, after hearing Rusty's story, has decided to help him. And today he tells Rusty, Now, my boy, you and Flip go over into that shack and get some sleep. Now, you keep out of sight until I've talked with Denver Julie. If he catches a runaway boy around his carnival, he'll blow up. Okay, Mr. Stovepipe, but I'm not running away because I did anything bad. I, I just want a job. So Rusty and Flip go to the old shack hidden in the bushes. As Rusty steps in the doorway, he sees it's dark inside. Golly, Flip, we haven't got a flashlight or anything. I guess we'll just have to feel around for a place to lie down. <laughs> Meanwhile.
Meanwhile, last picture top row, only a few yards away, two men who hate Denver Dooley, owner of the carnival, and who are hatching up a plan against him, are making their way toward the shack. Yeah, this way, Beagle. There's an old shack in here where we can talk. The other one replies, Okay, Specs, but I think we're taking an awful chance. We both got a record. They'll throw the book at us if we get caught. <laughs> At that moment, inside the shack, first picture, bottom row, Rusty is looking for a place to hide. He hears some stairs flip. Come on, boy. Let's see what it's like upstairs. No sooner does Rusty get upstairs and the two crooks come in. The man named Speck says, Hey, there's a lantern over there in the corner. Light it, Beagle. In the corner? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, here it is. Okay. As soon as the lantern is lit, Speck sits down, third picture bottom row, and says, Now listen, here's my plan. Dooley's never seen you, and I've changed enough so he won't know me. Now we start by getting a job with a Connie. Yeah, good idea. Now here he wants a lot of new concessions for the midway. Yes, we can still put on the old pitch. <laughs> And upstairs, Rusty, who is hiding with Flip, overhears what's being said and exclaims, Oh, golly! Oh, Rusty knows now that those men are planning to do something bad to Mr. Dooley. Yes, and if they knew that Rusty had heard their plans, you never know what they might do to him. I wonder if they'll discover that Rusty's overheard their plans. Well, plan we'll and... find that out next week. Now, let's pick up the first page of the second section. Oh, and I know who will find that. Dagwood and Blondie. You're right. Here we go on the first page of the second section with Dagwood and Blondie. For I'm a food, I'm a fun, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Blondie tells Dagwood that they're going to have a visitor, Mrs. Nellie Van Fleep, one of the leading society women in town. Dagwood exclaims, Hooray! We're in society now! So Dagwood and Blondie get everything ready to entertain Mrs. Van Fleet. We're in society now. We're in society now. Hi ho, the burial. We're in society now. Blondie gets out her best silver tea service. Dagwood gets out fancy cakes and tea sandwiches. Blondie goes over the house with a dust mop and then tells Dagwood to shake the mop out while she straightens the sofa. At that moment, Mrs. Van Fleet comes up the walk. And just as she stops in front of the door, the door opens and out comes a mop and shakes dust smack in her face. <laughs> We're in society now! We're in society now! I will the Mario! We're in society now! A few minutes later, last picture, second row, the phone rings. Blondie answers it. Then she turns to Dagwood and tells him that it's Mrs. Van Fleet calling from the drugstore. She says that somebody shook a mop in her face. Oh, we're ruined! A moment later, Blondie hangs up the phone and tells Dagwood that everything is all right, that Mrs. Van Fleet has accepted her apologies and is coming back again. Oh, we're saved! We're in society now! We're in society now! Hi, ho, the burial! We're in society now! But by this time, Blondie wants to be sure Dagwood is out of the way so he won't cause any more trouble. So she sends him out in the yard to play with Alexander while she does the entertaining. But Blondie, how can I become a social lion if I'm locked up in the backyard? But Blondie doesn't answer. Alexander sees Dagwood come out into the backyard and says to him, last picture, third row, Hey, you used to pole vault when you were young, didn't you, Pop? Why, sure, and I still can. Alexander's friend says... Well, let's see a pole vault over the fence, Mr. Bumpstead. So Dagwood takes the pole, throws out his chest, runs at the fence, and up on the air he goes, and comes down on the other side. And first picture, bottom row, oh, no, lands on the shoulders of Mrs. Van Fleet, who happens to be passing by. Hey, go, Nellie, go! Blondie looks out the window and stares in horror, for there's Dagwood sitting on the shoulders of Mrs. Van Fleet, who is galloping around the yard. And then she sees Dagwood tumble off, and Mrs. Van Fleet disappear down the road. Last picture, Dagwood, who was lying on the ground, shakes his head and moans, Oh, 
She bucked like a bronco. And Blondie sighs. Oh, well, I guess we weren't cut out to be society people. (laughs) (laughs) What did you think of that? Oh, I think that's one of the funniest things I've seen in my life. Dad was sitting on that woman's shoulders while she gallops around the yard. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I'm afraid Dagwood won't be in society now. No, Dagwood won't be in society. All right. Well, now let's turn over the page and see if we can find anybody else in society. Oh, look, on page two of the second section, there's Donald Duck, my favorite favorite. Oh, your social favorite. We'll read that right now, quick, fast. Here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squee, jump, squee, jump, squiggly, chick a check. Let's have music to fit a quack, quack. Donald has a new automatic furnace installed in his home. And after it's put into the basement, he goes into the living room and looks at his old pot-bellied iron stove and says, Now, to get this old monstrosity out of here. Fourth picture, top row. He's put the old stove outside on the boy's sled. There, set to go. Last picture, top row, he calls his nephews. Boy, come here. His nephews, who are playing in the snow, gather around Donald as he points to the stove. Haul this down to the city dump, boy. Oh, gee, we were going to build a snowman. First picture bottom row, Donald says. Look, when I get back from town, I don't want to see that stove here. Understand? Okay. Donald goes down to shop and then heads for home with his groceries. As he comes up the walk, third picture bottom row, he sees a big, fat snowman in his front yard. Now, Donald is sure the boys couldn't have built a snowman and gone to the city dump in that short time. Correct. Built a snowman instead of following orders. Well, I'll fix that. He puts down his groceries and takes a run at the snowman and tackles it. Ah! Last picture, he looks through... Brilliant colored stars to see what hit him and sees under the snow where the snowman stood his old iron stove. (laughs) Poor Donald. If he hadn't lost his temper, he wouldn't have lost the good feeling he had in his head. (laughs) That's funny. The boys thought they'd fool Donald by making a snowman over the outside of the stove. And it wasn't such a bad idea, was it? No, because the stove is round and fat like a snowman. Yes, and it would have worked if only Donald hadn't (laughs) lost his temper. Oh, that Donald, he's so funny. (laughs) Yes, he is. Now let's see what Roy Rogers is doing. So let's turn over page three. Oh, and oh, look, there on page four, there's Roy Rogers. And he's in the outlaw's hideout, you remember? Trying to catch the outlaw. Yes, and last week, Roy and Brimstone, his friend, found a secret passage that led to the Sphinx's office. He's the out- leader of the outlaws. And last week, Roy and Brimstone... Now let's see what Roy Rogers is doing. So let's turn over page three. And look on page four, there's Roy Rogers. And he's in the outlaw's hideout, you remember? Trying to catch the outlaws. Yes, and last week, Roy and Brimstone, his friend, found a secret passage that led to the Sphinx's office. He's the leader of the outlaws. Yes, and Roy also discovered that the reason the Sphinx never talks is that he has a thin, high-pitched baby voice. And while they were in the office, the other outlaws started to come in, and so Roy and Brimstone hid behind the screen. But the Sphinx made signs to the other outlaws and tell them that Roy was behind the screen, and I wonder what'll happen now. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. hi yip by oh now here we go with Roy and Trigger. hi yip by oh <laughs> Sphinx stands in front of the screen behind which Roy and Brimstone are hiding. Quickly, he signals to his men that Roy is behind the screen. Gusty, one of the men, pulls his gun and says, Okay, step out with your hands up, pronto. From behind the screen, Roy answers, Too late, mister. I got a beat on your boss. If you shoot, the Sphinx dies first. This stops the outlaws for a moment. Brimstone suddenly has an idea and disappears into the secret tunnel. Then, out in front of the screen, Gusty lowers his gun and says, Hey, uh, what about this, Sphinx? The Sphinx answers, Do as Roger says, Gusty. I don't aim to be plugged in the back. 
Gusty, hearing the Sphinx's strange voice, exclaims, Hey, the Sphinx talk! He never did that before! And then, last picture top row, Roy steps out from behind the screen. All right, reach high, everybody! The Sphinx is ashamed of his baby voice, but he can talk when he has to. First picture bottom row, the Sphinx whirls around, gun in hand. Get Bramstone Barlow behind that screen! I'll finish Roger! <coughs> oh! But it's Roy who shoots the gun out of the Sphinx's hand. The outlaws reach for their guns, but Brimstone steps in the doorway behind him. Hey, leave them irons be! Yeah, I reckon you gunnies don't know all the secret flannels and passages in your robber roost. Roy grins. Hey, nice going, Brimstone. Well, I guess this rounds up all that's left of the Sphinx's crew. A short time later, Roy and Brimstone are taking the bound outlaws to jail. Brimstone, who is riding along beside them, grins and says, I see, Jets. My guns are plugged, so they can't kill. If Brimstone Barlow can reform, so can you, hombres. Gusty answers, Yeah. Well, how can we reform after our necks are stretched? At that moment, last picture, a man runs out of the brush, shouting, Help! Help! Save me! Save me! Roy exclaims, uh-oh, that voice, I'd know it anywhere. And it always spells trouble. Ooh, wasn't it wonderful the way they really captured those outlaws? Yes, and it was mighty clever of Brimstone to have sneaked around behind the outlaws and catch them from the rear. You bet it was. Now Roy has rounded up another band of outlaws. I wonder who this fellow is that's coming running for help. He looks familiar to me, and I think next week we'll find out who he is and exactly how much trouble it'll mean for Roy. But now that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. and all you boys and girls. I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Diggly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.